In his new book, Faith in Our Struggle, A Memoir of Hope, Peter Sedi tells the story of how a young white South African, inspired by the staunch faith and example of his mother, the energy and courage of a small group of Christian activists, became integrally engaged in the underground struggle against apartheid. Peter used the time and space forcibly provided by the COVID-19 pandemic to reflect on his life as well as the values and choices that have and continue to shape his life during good and difficult times. In the foreword to your memoir, Reverend French Chikane reflects that your book represents one of the many untold stories of a generation of Christian activists. So why was telling that story so important to you? Well, I didn't tell the story for 40 years, <laughs> so that's an important part. But it became more and more important to me because although the early um, kind of years of the struggle in the church is well captured in terms of church leaders like Frank Chikani, like Archbishop Tutu, like Bayez Nodia, the ordinary you know, activists within the church, is very few of them have ever told the stories. And in terms of what actually shifted things in our struggle, it was the ordinary activists in the churches who were actually moving people and getting them to take sides with the oppressed in the struggle. And at key moments, that shift in the balance of forces, I believe, made a big difference to the outcome of our struggle. So I felt the story needed to be out there so that people could read it. Importantly, so they could learn from our mistakes and they could actually make improvements on some of the things that they, we are struggling for today. The important role of your mother as the source of both your faith and clear values of wrong and right comes through strongly throughout. So can you reflect on her role and that of your family in the decisions you made? Yeah, so I think it's very important that you understand that I'm one of nine children in a big family. <laughs> and and uh, my mother, although we were working class, had a major impact on ensuring all of us got a good quality education with sound moral principles. And I think that made a world of difference to the lives of all of my brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. All of us from those roots branched out into different professions, teachers, nurses, social workers, therapists, two entrepreneurs. <laughs> and um, all of them quite committed to helping develop the common good in our country. And from that kind of base. And I think the other important thing is that that faith that she had was a gift she gave to all of us. And um, she ensured when we were kids, whether we liked it or not, we went to church. <laughs> and um, the point about it was that it created a kind of ability for us to challenge one another if anybody was being selfish in just looking after their own needs and not the needs of the family. And there's something called black tax. Well, I write about it because we also grew up with that, where my older siblings were all contributing their paychecks to my mom and dad so that we could all get an education. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think, you know, the testimony of that is that all of my brothers and sisters in their own ways, you know, fought against what we saw was an injustice in our country of apartheid. And a number of us actually joined the underground based upon the values that they taught us. Joining the ANC underground was a significant and dangerous decision. What gave you the motivation to take part in that aspect of the struggle? Yeah, it was most probably the, one of the most difficult choices I ever made in my life, but also one of the most fulfilling. And the reason why we made that choice is we realized all of our little resistances as students, as young people in the country, towards bringing a change was not going to succeed without some coordinating body which would help to actually have a strategy which would succeed in changing apartheid. And the organization we all looked to was the ANC, which was coordinating and best place to lead that struggle. Our focus was very much on building leadership within youth, in student, in worker organizations. And as a result of building those legal organizations, we were able to identify good people who we recruited into the underground of the ANC. One of the big problems during the 80s was the gap between the ANC in exile and the weak underground that was developing within the country. There was a gap also between the mass democratic movement and the ANC in exile. And in a way, we were able to actually bridge that gap. 
um, by monitoring what was going on and reporting very quickly on the developments in the country to the leadership in exile. And although we were just out of our teens, young idealistic students, um, we were able to build an underground in the process of uh, and become a lot more confident in remaining one step ahead of the regime as they tried to block all forms of resistance at the time with states of emergency and lots of repression. And Peter, what could you say were the main achievements of your MK unit and the units you helped establish? In the early 1980s, I joined the ANC when I was 21, um, our underground structures were relatively weak. And our first task was to try and popularise the message of the ANC, um, which at that time was mainly brought into the country through um, publications like Suchaba, Umsebenzi, which we would distribute. They would be brought in through dead letter boxes. We would collect them and distribute them. Gradually, though, the ANC in exile recognised we were able to actually write the messages ourselves. And so we began writing the messages, photocopying them at night, secretly, printing thousands of them and redistributing them throughout the townships of Gauteng. In those days, we said the PWV, Pretoria, Bitwaters, Randverenigen. And the 30 underground members who were part of our structures were able to get the message of the ANC out very clearly throughout Gauteng. By the late 1980s, however, the third force was unleashing massacres on unarmed people. And whereas previously we were handling pamphlets, we now had to shift to collecting and distributing arms to people to defend themselves in Gauteng's townships. Because without that self-defense, massacres were, were taking place. And for example, um, we provided arms for self-defense units in Alexandra, not far from here, amidst the Six-Day War. And when the IFP in the hostels got return fire, the Six-Day War ground to a halt very quickly. People were not prepared to risk their lives when they were part of the Third Force. They were prepared to do it when they were unarmed people. Ronnie Kusrels, who provided feedback on your book, describes you and the Christian activists as Samaritans after the parable of the Good Samaritan. And there were several such individuals who helped inspire and guide you, notably Albert Nolan and members of Young Christian Students. So could you speak about the importance of those people? So Ronnie, as an atheist communist, was very surprised by the impact liberation theology had on us and on many Christians throughout the third world, in the sense that it made us quite committed to take radical steps to fight the evils that we saw in our society. And certainly our chaplains, especially Albert Nolan, as well as Chris Langefeld, and quite a few others, Mangaliso Makachwa, Sister Bernard Nube, had a major impact on us in challenging us to take sides with the oppressed. I mean, most of us as white middle class students were on a path into you know, professions which would enable us to have a good living. And it was almost like Paul falling off his horse and us realizing, actually, we're on the wrong side. <laughs> we have to actually get off and, and go onto the opposite side. And the spirituality and insight he offered us enabled us to see very clearly some of the moral dilemmas we faced. All of us as white males were conscripted into the army. Very few of us went to the army because we realized you can't fight on the wrong side. Um, we were prepared to fight in an army, but not the one that was oppressing people. And they had an ability to read the signs of the times and teach us as students to read the signs of the times in a way which would enable us to actually channel our youthful energy into working for justice. And so the theology they shared with us wasn't about an afterlife where God's kingdom and everything would be great, it was about how do we build God's kingdom here and now. And that inspired us in a prophetic way to understand much more clearly who Jesus really is in our country, in our situation. And they did this in ways which we just found impossible to be indifferent to. It was something attractive. It was something we wanted to be part of. It's something which I hope young people will also feel in, in the context of the struggles we face today that there's a joy in joining in with others who are struggling for a better society. So what was unique at that time for me and many of my friends in YCS 
It was the first time we as black, white, colored South African youth got together um, in the in, in YCS. So although people were coming from Soweto, from Soshanguwe, from Mamelodi, um, all the different townships around Gauteng with uh, youth from colored communities and white communities, we used to go on conferences together, we would talk, we would eat meals together, there was lots of laughter, singing, and just spending time getting to become more friendly with each other. And for us at that time, it was something which sparked in us a sense of what was possible in South Africa. Um, even the organizations of the struggle in terms of COSES and SESCO and NUSES, all of them were organized racially because of separate regions where things were racially organized. But at these conferences we came together, we shared the Eucharist, we sang hymns together, and we had a strong sense that God was with us in our struggle against apartheid and that he would strengthen our efforts to resist and build the society that we were getting a taste of as students in this non-racial environment. And a lot of the friendships we built at that time are still friends. Um, my colleague who I work with today, I met when we were both in high school. <laughs> um, he was from Soweto, I'm, I'm from Johannesburg, but we still work together as partners and that friendship started there. So. We loved being together. There was a joy that kind of overflowed in the laughter that you heard in the corridors. And we had a strong sense that what we were fighting for was worth making sacrifices for. My hope is that young people in South Africa can still have that sense of belonging, which inspires them to overcome some of the challenges which we face at the moment, um, across races, across classes, in a way which actually helps us to forge a new united South Africa. And Peter, your post-apartheid career has also drawn strength and inspiration from your youth work, particularly your time as principal at a youth detention centre. What did you seek to achieve at Dayambu? So I was a teacher at a high school here in Johannesburg um, when I got the opportunity to go and work in that detention centre for juveniles. Now. The reality for me was that in the mid-90s, after independence, I went and started working there. And I knew that freedom would mean nothing if the young people, especially boys in my situation, of urban poor people had no opportunities for them except for crime. And if all of these young people were landing in jail, the likelihood would be that they would actually get convinced and come out hardened criminals. So for me, it was like a commitment to get into that environment and help people to develop skills in creative ways, which would enable them to actually generate income when they came out legally. So when I went to the detention center, it was run, it was Diambu at that time, but it later on became Bosasa and it was run under Gavin Watson's auspices. And the problem was that most of the staff had a very punitive impact on the young people. They saw that they could beat the devil out of these boys. But the Department of uh, Social Welfare was very critical of that. And so they wanted a different approach. And what I tried to do is help bring in a spirituality into that environment, which would help the boys to see themselves differently. If they believed they were rubbish and they were criminals, they would definitely come out as hardened gangsters. If we help them to shift their attitude and see the good people they are, they would come out with a different approach. So one of the things I did is I made it compulsory for every boy to join a class. He could either do carpentry, um, electrical repairs, um, motor mechanics, welding, arts and crafts. But every young man in that detention center had to join a class where he would learn a skill. And we would assess the boys and they would get certificates of competence and I mean we got to the point where we were doing it really well and the parents asked us can my son not just stay a bit longer to finish his course even though his sentence is up. It became more of a boarding school and by the way we still continue now with this work with unemployed youth who have left school but have no opportunities, they haven't got enough uh, of a score to get into tertiary institutions. And last year, the non-profit organization which is linked to our company, it's called Meriting, and they 
enable 200 young people in Johannesburg to get qualifications of learnerships and quite a few of those young people are now finding work. So we're still committed to the same kinds of things that we were doing long ago, but just in a different context now. And Peter, your values were also challenged at Diambu, given that it was operated by now notorious Busasa group under Gavin Woodson. Your clashes at Busasa seemed to provide early insight into the corrupt culture that eventually enveloped the company. Initially, um, Gavin and the others were very happy with the credibility we were providing because the youth centre was their flagship. They also ran Lindela, the repatriation centre, um, but the repatriation centre had a very bad name for all the negative incidents which were taking place there. And so they wanted to get credibility and they were very happy with the direction in which I was taking the youth centre at the time. But, and this is important, a person like Gavin Watson had the potential to make a very positive difference in the country. Um, there was a part of him that wanted to make a difference to the lives of these young boys who were incarcerated and he was prepared to support the vision that I was working on. But as time went on, he became more and more keen on getting power and money and in the process I think he lost something of the goodness that he had inside of him at the, at the beginning. And slowly, slowly, he asked me to do things which clashed with my own Christian values. And in the end, I was dismissed on trumped-up charges when I refused to carry out instructions which would compromise my conscience and my team's integrity. So, yeah, the funny part for me was after five years of working in that environment, I had a, a major sense of what positive work we were able to do with many of the young people. I'm a facilitator now. And I meet some of the boys when I come to different companies and I'm training staff. And I meet some of the boys who are now men who were once in the juvenile facility. And the first thing they say to me is, shh, don't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm very proud when I see that they've actually been able to turn their lives around. Many of them are fathers to children now, family members. That's something which I'm still very committed to in terms of working with young people, helping them to, I think those formative years around late teens are key in people's lives. And if you can put people in a better direction, they can, they can move forward much quicker. And lastly, Peter, you conclude your memoir with the social analyst of South Africa and much of the rest of the world and assess it through the lens of your faith. So what do you see as the signs of our times and how can we approach these challenges with a sense of hope rather than despair? Well, if you ask any South Africans about signs of hope at the moment, they've got to look quite hard in the dark. <laughs> but I don't think that means there aren't signs of hope. Because in any crisis situation, there's always challenges and opportunities. And yes, our lights are off. We don't have water sometimes. Um, we have all kinds of climate change consequences in terms of droughts and floods. Our economy is not in the best state. So there's a lot which is concerning, especially for poor people in our country. But at the same time, there's always signs of hope. For me as a Christian, one of the things we can never have is give up on hope. Um, despair is not an option. Um, it's true, um, we've been in these situations before. If I go back to the 1980s, during states of emergency, there was a lot which could go wrong. We were on the verge of a civil war. And yet we were able as South Africans working together to get out of that situation and bring in a new democracy which enabled many people to get new opportunities which were not there before. So while the context is quite different now, in my work I do as a facilitator, training ordinary people working in companies, training unemployed youth, I still see that kind of glimmer of hope in the eyes of people who continue to try to make a better life for themselves and for their families, but not just for themselves. Also a commitment to actually serve the, the interests of poor people and a common good. I think one of the difficulties we had post-94 is we were very naive. We put a lot of faith and trust into political parties and sadly the human frailties have been terribly exposed, especially in the Zondo Commission, 
once people got into positions of power. I think what we need to do is redefine what the new threats are to our young democracy and ensure that we prevent the forces who want to hijack our struggle and make the inequalities bigger, make the racism worse, make um, violence become much more of a reality. We have to find ways to stop that um, and correct the wrongs. And what we hear from church leaders in the SACC, and Tabum Khobo came out the other day with another statement, is that we as civil society, we as the ordinary people, the people who always make history, need to come together again in South Africa and begin to push the reset button and start again. Now, how we do that is we have to find our own creative solutions at this time. But part of why I wrote the book is because I believe in the agency of ordinary people. When ordinary people come together, work together, make changes, things begin to, to happen again. And I think the time is ripe for us to do that as South Africans again. That was Peter Sedi speaking to Krima Media's polity about faith in our struggle.